job review is something that comes after we take a job. And we would not be smart to take a job knowing that a review is coming without reading the job description. Agree? The job has a description of what we are being hired for. And we know that it's going to come back to a time where we are going to walk down that job description. So for us to say, this is not important, I will throw this away. When that time comes, we are going to wish that we did not throw that piece of paper away. Because all of those things is exactly what we're going to go down. You were serious about that? This is what we're going to look at today because Christians do have a job description. They were saved. Or I hopefully can say we were saved for a purpose. And that is the point and the name of the, the passage, the sermon today. This is the third of three weeks dedicated towards stewardship. And soon we are going to be asking for an intended contribution. So that means what you plan on giving to the church for the year. Does not mean that it's a contract that we will take you to court for if you do not fulfill it. It is something that you plan on giving so that we can see as a church what we are able to do and what we are not able to do. We have to be good stewards of what God gives us. So therefore, that soon will be coming, but also, um, in fact, I think there are cards in your bulletin today that are in there that also are for the intended contributions. If not, there are extra ones that are up front uh, um, on the table as you come in. Um, just ask for someone, uh, one of the elders, I'm sure, will, knows exactly what they look for, like, and they'll, they'll tell you. Um, soon you should also be getting something in the mail as well. And we're going to also be voting on the church budget soon. So, today's passage is out of Revelation chapter 1. And it is going to go through the first eight verses. Revelation is a time of oppression. This is where John the Apostle is on the island of Patmos for his faith. And um, he is basically imprisoned. And Jesus appears to him on the island of Patmos. John's the only one that was not martyred according to extra biblical sources. So outside of the Bible, the accounts of that time say that John is the only one that was not killed for his faith, but he definitely is suffering for it, no doubt. So here is the passage before we actually get to um, yeah. This is the first few verses before we actually get to the three sections that I want to focus in on. So it says this is the beginning of the whole book. The revelation. Notice how it does not say revelations. That's where the book comes from. The name is revelation, not revelations. It's the book of revelation. So the revelation, that's how most of the books were named, is the first couple of phrases that were listed in that book became the name of the book. So, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show. Why did he give it to him? To show his servants the things that, might, that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel, so his messenger is what angel means, to his servant John who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw.
Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. I'm going to pause there for a second. I know some people that say, I don't read the book of Revelation because it freaks me out. <laughs> that is a very foolish decision. Blessed are those who read this book. That's important. In fact, it even says it twice. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it for the time is near not just those who hear it and understand it but those who read it who hear it and who do it who keep it who protect it even is what the word means who guard it who put it into their life for the time is near. We're going to look at three sections today. Very short text because it's only four through eight that we're looking at. And they expose our purpose as Christians. We have a purpose. There is a reason why God saved us. Yes, He loves us, but there's more to it than that. More to it. And we'll see why this is important here today. And this absolutely has everything to do with stewardship. Everything. Because let me put it this way. If we don't understand what our purpose is, how are we ever going to fulfill that? We will come to a day of the job review and we'll say, I didn't know. I never read the job description. And God will say, I gave you, I've told you this many times, what country were you part of? America. Yes, America has more Bibles in it than any other country in the world. You have no excuse. The job description was in there many times. So let's explore it so that we know what our purpose is. So, First section, who Jesus is, is what we're looking at. In verse 4, it says, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. So the seven churches, it means, seven means total, complete. It also means good. Seven is in the days of creation, so creation, and at the end of the seven days of creation, God said that it was good, right? Each day, and it was even on the sixth day that it wasn't just good, but it was very good, and then he rested. Seven is the fullness of creation, all of what God had intended. It is a number of 666 would be the number of the beast, seven three times would be a symbol of the Trinity and the fullness of God as intended. So all of my churches is what that's saying. The seven represents all of God's churches throughout time. All of them that exist then, all of them that exist now, and they were all in the area of Asia at that time. So, and it is a new creation. The church is a new creation for Jesus. He's the head of the church. He is the one who died for the church. He created a new. And the church is the, I was going to say object, but it is the headquarters of where the advancing of God's kingdom comes out from. Now the army are the people and the individuals of the church, but the church is what empowers those people to go forward. It's what teaches and develops and strengthens. So grace is what came through Jesus. Grace came through Jesus. That comes out of the book of John, right? Grace is something we did not deserve. God gave it to us. Salvation. But he also reinstated us as priests, which we definitely don't deserve that. Mercy would be not giving us the judgment that we had coming to us. 
Grace is reinstating us as priests. That is amazing in itself. And we're going to come back to that because that's a huge part of today's passage. And peace. Peace is shalom. It's a, 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 a Hebrew word that goes throughout all of, of the scriptures. Jesus the Messiah is the prince of peace. Prince also and king are interchangeable as far in Hebrew. So you could say prince or king either way. He is the prince or king of peace. It's where we're going. Peace, rest, it's the Sabbath. It's on the seventh day. It's part of who God is, who the people that God rescues become. Do not forget who you are. You are a people who are a people who rest. You work hard, just like God worked for seven days or six days, but on the seventh day he rested, and you also will be a people who rest. It also is to remind us, so it's to remind us who we are, but also it's to remind us where we're going, that God is taking us to a land of rest, right? The promised land. But Hebrew scriptures, in the book of Hebrews, it says it's only a partial fulfillment of what is to come. There is a greater peace, a greater rest even to come. Grace and peace. It's what God gave us. And what we are on a journey towards is rest, peace. So from him who is, was, who is, who was, and who is to come. He is the God of eternity. This is referring specifically here to God the Father. Later, what's interesting is that you will see Jesus takes on that same name. And in the throne room, they all worship him, all of the angels, as he who was He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the end. There is no end, though, to him. He who was, who is, who was, and who is to come. Eternal. And seven spirits is a way of referring to the Holy Spirit. So seven, fullness of God. The spirits, seven spirits that sit before the throne, before the Father. There is a hierarchy, definitely, in heaven. None of the three, the Father, the Spirit, and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, none of them individually are any less God than the other, but there is a hierarchy. The Father is at the top, the Son is in the middle, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from both of them. But they are all essential and God, all of them. They work together, the church and the Spirit, the seven churches, and you see the seven spirits before the throne of God. These are supposed to work together in harmony. He stands among the lampstands is something that comes out of verse 12 that we haven't read and we won't read, but it's, if you continue reading the first chapter, Jesus stands among the seven lampstands and the lampstands are revealed right after that as being the seven churches. So it shows us what we are supposed to be light in a world of darkness. All of these things linked together. So continuing. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. So this, the third here is Jesus. We had the Father, the Spirit, and now Jesus. And Jesus is the main focus. That's what the revelation is. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it describes him in three ways. Which is interesting because you have the Trinity also that was just mentioned here. First one is faithful witness. Then the word in Greek is martus. It's where you get the word martyr. Faithful witness, even to the point of death. A faithful witness is one you can trust. One that will not bend, even when it comes to their own safety. Even if it means that they die in the process of holding on to what they know is truth. Dependable, trustworthy, faithful. He's an example for all who are his. And it is a way of saying, do not compromise my word. 
Second explanation of Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. He is the first. All after him, all who follow him are his. All who walk in his footsteps are his. He conquered death. He is heaven's champion. If all things you see also in the book of uh, Colossians, talks about how all things are his, created through him and for him, by him. If he's the one that all things were created for, then he's also the one that if there is a new creation have to be created also through him because all things are created through him and for him, by him. So he has to be the first. He has to die and conquer death in order for us to have life. He is the first one to pave that path for us to go back to heaven. Because as it stands, without him, there is no way back to God. And third is the ruler of the kings of the earth. He's over all human beings, including Caesar. That's important, especially at that time. Because John is on the island of Patmos, and he's the only survivor. I mean, you don't have to be that intelligent to figure out if you're John. The 11 others all died. My path doesn't look very good. Caesar is the one who actually himself is responsible, I would say, ultimately for all... Well, that's not true because some of them went outside even the Roman kingdom. But Peter was killed by Caesar. So was Paul in Rome, according to extra-biblical sources. But Jesus is over even Caesar. No one is above him. He's the ultimate ruler, though that might not be completely felt yet. The fact is that he is over all, even though it might not be seen yet in this world. He is over all things. So this is a message from the Godhead, and it's establishing where the message is coming from. Understand who this comes from and who it's to. This is from the Godhead, who rules over all things, who is completely trustworthy, who even died for you first before he ever called you even in to walking with him. He is trustworthy, even to the point of death, so that we might live. So to him who loves us and frees us from our sins by his blood, he died for us. And he shows us his love by willing to die for people who in other parts of scripture it shows that we were his enemies. Through his self-sacrifice he shows his love and frees us from all sin. So Jesus is the example of faithfulness even to death. He conquers death. It could not hold him, so he lives. And the third is that he rules over all of the earth. This is a message of grace and peace. And remember, blessed are all who read it and do what it says. The greatest leaders establish loyalty. Why would I follow this person into battle? That's how David was, King David. How does he get mighty men? He had many mighty men that would do insane things, things that were miraculous. He had three of them that rode into a town to a well that was guarded heavily by another military. They risked their own lives and draw, drew water from the well for David just because he said, what I would do to have a drink of water from the well, I believe, of Bethlehem. And they rode in and they rode out And he pours the water out onto the ground and says, basically, ultimately what he's saying is, is the life of my men are much more important than my um, feeling good. I would never drink this because drinking this would show that I do not value your lives at all. And that might not make sense to us, but that was something that was huge to his men. He put loyalty and integrity 
He valued justice heavily. And his men knew this, so they fought hard for him. Jesus is the ultimate, trustworthy, conquering king of all who loves him. He's the king of all who loves him. So much, he loves us so much that he would die for us so that we might live. Why would we not follow someone like that? Why would we not listen to someone like that? Why would we not value his words so much that every single word that comes from his mouth would be like treasure? If he went to such extremes, his message and what he did is absolutely essential for our salvation. And my question is, where do you sit as his servant? Jesus's. Do we follow him wherever he leads us? One that we trust, we'll go anywhere that they go. Why? Because we know that they're trustworthy. These military people, I mean, some would say, now here's the thing, some military might, and that might even in the military of America might say, well, you know what, if you didn't obey, you'd be punished if you didn't ride in or whatever, do what you needed to do. Maybe that's there. But let me put it this way, in Israel, you had the right to leave before a battle if you were afraid and didn't want to go forward. The priest was to come forward and say, anyone who is afraid, anyone who has just been married and not had time with their new wife, anyone who is not confident in going forward, please leave now. Because you will ruin the confidence and courage of the rest of the people that are here. I only want the people that want to be here. And they would see miracle after miracle after miracle. These men went into battle and did the amazing because they had a leader that they could trust in David. Jesus, because they could trust. Are we loyal servants of Jesus and follow him where he leads us? Second is who Christ's followers are, who we are. So let me back up to make sure you get the fullness of this passage. So and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He made us to be a kingdom. Some passages in the Old Testament say of priests. Some in the New Testament say a kingdom and priests. But either way, it's to God, who is the Father also of Jesus, Father God, and to Him be glory. Father or Jesus, it doesn't matter. It's the same being, ultimately, the Trinity to God is the glory and the dominion, the power, the rule forever and ever. Amen. Kingdom and priest. This is the key here. This is our purpose. We were saved to be a kingdom and priests on this earth to God for his glory and his power to be seen. In Exodus 19, 3 through 6, it says, Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then... Out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, I'm the king of the earth, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. 
So what I'm getting at is this. This is what God proclaimed to Israel, the people that he saved out of Egypt. And what John is doing is he's carrying this over and he's saying us as Christians now are brought into that. We don't have to be Jews to be a kingdom of priests on earth. We are all now kingdom of priests. These are the words that you are to speak to the Israelites. So let me say this. The tribe of Levi, first of all, there were 12 sons of Israel. Levi was the third oldest. Levi was the priest of the kings or of the tribe of, of Israel. Their name, Levi, means to cleave to, to cling to. In Genesis, it talks about marriage. A man will leave his mother and father and cleave to, cling to his wife. What I'm getting at is this. It's the same exact word as Levi. is the same word as marriage. These people were planned by God to be the ones that teach God's people how to be married to God. How do we be married to God? As Christians, we carry this over. We are saved to teach God's people how to be married to God. Do you follow me on this? Do we know how to even do that? There is no excuse. That's what we're saved for, is to teach other people and to bring them in to be a kingdom that rules here on earth of priests for this earth. That's our point. They were to be holy to the Lord. That means separate. Because they embraced the presence of God. They were closer than all the rest of Israel. So the camp in the tabernacle was set up so that there were, there were 12 tribes. And it's... Uh, the bottom line is, to make it very simple without going into a big explanation, is that all the tribes were set up in a circular pattern around the tabernacle, and the tribe of Levi, were the, they circled the entire tabernacle first. They were the closest. The other tribes set up camp around them. And it says that they even protected God's people from his presence from reaching out against them, from striking them in wrath. So their whole teaching and everything that they did, they're interceding for God's people. The sacrifices. So in our sense, it would be praying for people and teaching them how to embrace the salvation of Jesus. How to stay away from the wrath of God. How to come into His love. How to embrace Him. That's what priests are. Priests are supposed to intermediate between God and the people of this world. Do we follow? That's our point. Our point of being saved is not the prosperity gospel of God saved me so that I can be happy. That's not why I was saved. I was saved so that I can help other people know God and be come into the salvation of God. And the very things that I've gone through, the struggles that I have, empowers me that much better to reach in and pull people that are even deeper into the darkness than most. I can go into caves that other people can't go into because I know the way out. I also know the way in. I've been there before. That's what we were saved for. To be a kingdom of priests on earth for the glory and the power of God to be seen. That's what we were to be here for. That's our purpose. In Hebrews 12, 12 through 15, it says, Therefore lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for, the, for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone 
and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. That's a weird way of putting it, but the bottom line is, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Without us being separate, God is holy. He says, because I'm holy, you are to also be holy. Be like me. We are to be like him so that we are different from the world. And what the writer of Hebrews is saying is that if we don't do that, no one will see God. Holiness is absolutely essential. That doesn't change from the Old Testament to the New Testament. That's why this is a, a concept that is just foreign to Christians, because we don't like to read the book of Leviticus. That's where it's shown. Holiness is essential. That's why Levit the, the Levites surrounded the tabernacle, because they were holy. They were dedicated to God. And they were there to teach and to intercede for God's people. And it hasn't changed in this world. Why do you think some people don't get their prayers answered? Even that are Christians. Because they've journeyed so far from God that they don't even hear Him or see Him anymore. They don't know the way home. And that's actually a lot of people in this world. They've gone so far and been so deceived, so, they're so confused about even who they are, what they are, what things, what they're supposed to believe, what's truth, what's false. They have no idea anymore. And we just resort to, well, whatever is truth for you is good for you, and whatever is good for me is good for me, and let's just leave it at that. Why fight? Let's all just love one another. That's what Satan does, is he confuses us as to what our purpose even is. If we understand what our purpose is, we get a second chance at knowing God and serving Him. We get a chance to come close. We get a chance to know His holiness. And when we do, He says, I want to glorify myself through you. I want to heal people. I want to transform people. And if you're willing to come close to me, I will bring you in to me, and I will use you in powerful ways to bring other people in to me as well. But you have to surrender to me, which we'll come to in a second. So they were also to guard the house of God from the enemies of God. Adam and Eve failed that in Genesis. They were supposed to keep the garden. That's part also means guard. And they failed. Do we fail when that happens? Or do we protect the throne room, the presence of God? So the throne room scene in Revelation 5, 8 through 10, is a powerful scene. Let me read it to you. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, this is God the Father, this is a vision that John is seeing. Awesome. He's in the throne room of God. And he sees the Father as a glowing, awesome light. And in his hand, he holds this scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. So it is of God. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice. The seven seals represent the salvation of God and coming of the Christ, basically. The, the end of his, the wrapping up of his salvation and redeeming a handful and destroying the rest of the earth, whoever does not um, embrace his salvation. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside of it. And I wept. I wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. The reason why he cries is because humanity is lost. There's no hope. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb. So he pronounces who Jesus is. He is the 
prevailing, the, the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. That's what he is. But then he sees a lamb that's been slaughtered. So what he sees and what he, experience, or what he hears is totally different. And that's just like where we're at today. What Jesus is, is the conquering king of all of the earth. But what we experience and what we actually see is something very different. Then I saw the lamb, looking as though he had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by four living creatures and elders. The lamb had seven horns. Horns is a symbol of power. He was completely and utterly all-powerful. And seven eyes, all-knowing is what that represents, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So the spirit of God and this lamb are one. And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat at the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which were the prayers of the God's people. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because... You were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. And they will reign on earth. It gives me goosebumps how powerful that is. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on earth. That's who we are. Jesus purchased for the Father these people so that they would serve the kingdom. They would be a kingdom and priests serving our Lord in His glory and power. What happens when you use something, a tool that you shouldn't use in a specific job? I'll give you an example. What happens if you use the universal tool, a hammer, to do what you should be using a saw to do? Or a screwdriver? I remember My wife is not going to be happy about this, but it's a good example. So um, when I was installing lights under our cabinetry, I needed a little saw to just put a little hole in the corner of the cabinet to feed the uh, cord through. Thank you. I didn't have a saw, so I used a, a drill. It worked. Thankfully, it's hidden underneath the cabinetry, so you can't see it. And she wouldn't even know if I didn't say anything about that. But I'm making all these holes and pounding it out, and it worked. It worked. But it could have been done. It didn't look as pretty as it could have been done, as neat as it could have been. If we're not operating in our purpose, it's going to be messy. It's going to be messy. It ain't going to look like the way it's supposed to. And when people say, why, God is, why is God not doing what he used to do in the Bible? Because we're not being what we used to be or what we were supposed to be. We are not embracing our purpose as we were supposed to embrace it. That's why. An honor privilege? Do we understand our purpose and do we live in it? If we don't, let me, okay, if we are going into battle and we have access to a great warrior, wouldn't it be smart to train with that warrior? If you know that that war is coming and they know some kind of kung fu, whatever it is, 
that can make you go in, and they are just incredible. Would you not spend all kinds of time with them saying, train me so that I'm prepared? Otherwise, I'm going to be like a guy riding into battle with a butter knife. Everybody is, instead of praying over me, and they're going to be shaking my hand saying, it was nice to know you. You're a very nice person. We know we're never going to see you again, though. Because you ain't going to make it through this. It is a battle. And God gives us everything that we need. Everything. My question is, if you haven't prepared, what can you do to start preparing yourself more? Don't use age as something, whether it be too young or too old, or too busy or whatever. Those are all excuses. Anytime you can start. Anytime preparing for how to be a better priest here on earth. It's what we were all called into. And the final is the accountability. So verse 7, it says, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come the Almighty. One day the Lord Jesus will return. There will be no denying who he is and everyone will clearly see this. The very last chapter of the Bible I want to jump to and read a few of the passages that are there. This is what he says, verses 10 through 16. This is how the Bible wraps up. It says, and he said to me, Jesus, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil, let, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. What he's saying is, is be this, join in the priesthood. But the bottom line is, is what they are is what they are, and that's not up to you to decide. Let those that want to embrace evil, embrace it. Let those that embrace uh, righteousness, embrace it. Let those that want to be holy with God and separate, let them embrace it. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. When Jesus comes again, he's bringing recompense. It's award. Compensation for payment or payment for what we do. So some might say, well, I thought that we can't earn our way into heaven. That's not what he's saying. What we do validates or invalidates our faith. It's not the things we do that save us. It's the overflow of our heart which shows, do we really have the Spirit or not? And don't let Satan confuse you by conviction of saying, well, you're a bad person, look what you do. The bottom line is if our heart is directed towards God, he will continue to sanctify us more and more. As we serve him, he will continue to move us more and more to a place of holiness, more and more and more. If we are walking with him, that's what Jesus is saying. If you are walking, I will repay you according to what you do according to your path that you walk on, according to the things that you have done in this life that show what path are you on. Are you on the path of God or are you in rebellion against God? It doesn't matter what you say. What he's saying is my repayment is for what your life, the path that your life walked. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city gate by the gates. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood, the worldly. 
I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. The whole revelation is for the church. I give you this revelation for my churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. So here's why that's important. And then we'll wrap this up. In the book of Chronicles, I just got as good. He, 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 I'm, my own personal study happened to just fall this week exactly and fits perfectly into this message here. Chronicles is what I'm starting to read. The book of Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles, is an account of the history of Israel in their leadership. Well, it even goes back as far as descendants all the way to the beginning. But ultimately, there's two, what, it, what it's saying is it's showing the importance of the advancing of the kingdom of God and what that is. And it is tied directly, twofold, to two things. One, the Davidic covenant. Meaning, it shows, it represents the promise of God for the Messiah that will reign on the throne of David forever. It also is an image of surrender by God's people and loyalty to a great king. And it's the example of service that David was to God. Humble, surrendered. Even when he made a mistake, he humbled himself before God and was forgiven. So the Davidic covenant and the importance of it and the temple. Those two things are constantly interweaved through the history of Israel, the importance of the Davidic covenant, and all kings are, are compared to him. Those of you that have read it, right? You know it. This was a good king because he ruled in the ways of David. This was a bad king because he did not rule. He was evil and did not embrace God like David did. And the other thing is the temple. The presence of God is represented in the temple and our preeminent care for it. How badly do we protect that? God's presence. If we're stewards, he gives us something, the church, for a reason, right? He gives us gifts to build the church. We are even said that we are stones in the building of the church. And we will be held accountable for that. The last thing I want to talk, just to bring this into close, closing, is the parable of the talents from Luke 19. I'm going to summarize it, though. It says at the beginning, as they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable, Jesus did, because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed, his disciples, that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. So he wanted to show them. It's not like that. So he told them this parable. And he said, therefore, a nobleman, it's a symbol of him, went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Remember, Jesus says, I go away to prepare a place for you. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas, money. And he gave, said to them, engage in business until I come. What's the command? Engage in business with what I gave you until I come again. But the citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. <laughs> that ain't good. We don't want this man to reign over us. So when he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know what they had gained by doing business. Accountability. The first one said, Lord, here's your minna, has gained ten more. And he says the phrase that I think all want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, because you have been faithful with very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came forward and said, your minna has made five minas. And he said to him, you are to be over five cities. And the third one basically buried his minna in a handkerchief. 
And he accuses him saying that you are cruel and taking things that you don't take. He was afraid, basically, and probably bitter. And he says, so here, I've returned your minna for you. I buried it, and I give it back. Didn't use it at all. And he says to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in a bank? And at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, take the minna from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he already has ten minas. I said, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want to, me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. This is loving Jesus. So the final point here is this. We are going to be asked a question at the end of our lives. What did you do with my son? What did you do with my son? He died for you, and he is my greatest value of all of creation. What did you do with him? Do we read, listen, and do what is commanded of us? Or do we bury what we have been given in fear or in bitterness? What has God given you? And how will you be rewarded for managing these gifts? Remember in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. This is imperative. Not if you have time. Not if you want to. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. You know the way back to me. Teach them it. And behold, I am with you always to the end of age. So he even says, you're not going alone. I'm going with you. We're going to do this together. But I don't save you to just be comfortable. I save you to go to work. You are here for a reason. We should be inspired by reward. Here's my experience. Let me just get right to it. When I was in marketing... I remember I gave uh, incentives for people to give them money. I thought, that'll do it. I gave away a lot of money, many times for contests. And it didn't really produce that great of results. I was baffled by this. I was like, what could I get to do that get them more motivated? You know what got them more motivated? Fear. I let them have contests with each other. It wasn't me that struck fear into them. I didn't threaten their jobs or anything like that. I just let them basically pick contests with each other. And they would, I said, really, ultimately, the rules are very open. So you can make it pretty disgusting as long as it's not like illegal or anything like that or nobody can get hurt or anything. They had some of the most disgusting pies in the face that they would do. I mean, stuff that I was like, that's disgusting. It couldn't be hard enough to break your face or anything like that to hurt you, and it had to be humanly edible. But that was about it. Those were the only rules. And I did, it was pretty funny. I mean, watching this, I was like, oh my, I'd hold it my nose, go and we'd be taking pictures. People worked so hard for that. So hard. And I was like, why don't people work hard for the good? Being excited about what is the good side of things. We do. We work hard to either avoid pain or gain pleasure. And unfortunately, it's in our nature, I learned the hard way, that we will work harder to avoid pain than we will to gain pleasure even. Whatever it is, I don't care what motivates us. I hope that we're motivated for what God promises because that is so much better. There is something to be extremely excited about. We get to walk with God in his presence. What better 
thing as there possibly to be. That's why we were, we were created as humans, to know God intimately and walk with Him and be one with Him. There's nothing better than that. That should be what motivates us more than anything. But also know that because He even gives us that, there is an accountability that also is there. He's saying, I'm coming again. That's how he ends his book. I'm coming again. Those of you that embrace holiness and righteousness, let them continue. Those that want to be evil, let them continue. Either way, just know I'm coming again. And I will pay back whatever it is that you do. I will reward those that are good and faithful servants. And those that do not, and they ignore my word and do not listen to me, they also will be repaid. Jesus is not unfair. What he says is, I'm telling you this ahead of time. Know it and decide where you sit. Where are you? And to me, there's nothing better in life than watching God not only heal a person and transform them, but then also watch the Spirit of God come in and use them to be able to help bring other people in. Once we get to be a part of that, there's no way we would ever not want to be a part of it. This world tries to keep us busy so that we won't be part of the advancing of his kingdom, and it's really good at it. It's important for us to know these things, to refocus us as to what our purpose is. And I'm promising that if we embrace it, all of us will know that there's nothing better. Nothing better. There's no way that we will ever look back and say, ah, I wish I never met Jesus. So the statement is Christians are to use what Jesus gives them for the advancement of his kingdom on earth. The first week was Jesus' kingdom is where we, is Jesus' kingdom where we invest our treasures. That was the first week. Second one, is our heart willing and good, submissive and passionate, honored to build Jesus' house? Is our heart in the right place? And today... Do we remember that our very purpose here on earth is to advance his kingdom as priests, to protect his presence and to intercede for those in this earth that are trapped in the darkness? Do we know who we are and do we live in it? Because if we do, the stewardship that we have, I guarantee will fall into place. All of it. We're excited about what we're part of. We remember that everything else is merely filler. We are here for a purpose. Whether we embrace it or not is our choice. And God gives us that free will. My point here today is to hopefully help us remember what our purpose is. Not to scare us, but to reveal truth. And the point is, we have been given an incredible honor. May we all embrace it. Amen? Let's pray.